Hi there. Uh, have you ever wanted to torture an English teacher? Let me tell you how to do it. Um, in your uh, that you're sen submitting or your exam, where you read a poem, call it a novel. Where you read a novel, call it an academic article. Where you see an academic journal's article, call it a journal entry. We will get white hair, we will scream, we will bang our heads against the wall so much that um, uh, there'll be a dent in the wall. Um, it, we hate that because we want you to understand the differences between genres of writing. In order to understand what is being said to you, you have to understand how it is being said to you. I'll give you a really simple example of what I'm talking about. I have a book coming out at the end of the year. It'll be my fourth collection. It's called The Bunker Book. In The Bunker Book, I write poems. It's a collection of poetry. Um, and in uh, The Bunker Book, I have Nazis and Nazi hunters running around the Superdome. In a poem, I could just do anything. I mean, I could have a space aliens land too. Why not? Um, uh, I would have what's called poetic license to do anything. And people understand when they read that poem that I'm not literally saying that there are Nazis and Nazi hunters running around the Superdome. What they understand is I'm talking about Nazis and Nazi hunters and the Superdome somehow together to make a point of some kind. And we could ponder what the point is, but we know I'm not talking about real life because it's a poem. In your essays, though, if I were to write an essay about Nazis and Nazi hunters uh, in English 102, if I were a student uh, running around the Superdome, I would have to have proof. You already know this from your first essay. I would have to be able to prove to you that the Superdome had some connection to either Nazis or Nazi hunters and that there was an opposing force that is coming to have a conflict near the Superdome uh, between these two forces of political thought. Uh, do I have such evidence? I do not. When I wrote that poem, my point was to have a different conversation about a wrestling for the soul for America of America, how, who we are determined to be as a nation. It was a metaphor. Ross Gay is not writing academic essays. He's a poet. People have referred to this collection of uh, essays, I say in quotes, because he calls them essays throughout as lyrical essays. Lyric means that they are of a poetic nature talking in the first person. So uh, you know how a lot of love uh, songs are called, you know, they have lyrics, you know, and most of those lyrics, if you're honest, throughout history have been Ooh, baby, why don't you love me? I love you so much. That is pretty much the standard lyric. I mean, that's existed since ancient Egypt. Um, and so not all lyrics are that, but many are. Uh, Ross Gay is writing lyrical essays. But what he's doing, and this is worth paying attention to, is he's making a comment on how we process information. He, delight. The Book of Delights, delight is not a factual information, a piece of factual information. How would you know this? Let me give you an example from your own life. Um, have you ever watched a movie and you're like, I can't believe you made us watch this stupid movie. I hate this. Um, and the person next to you is like, oh my God, it was so beautiful. I've never seen anything like this in my life is changed. That person took a kind of delight in the beauty of this film. You, nah, you really didn't. So delight itself is subjective. Not everything delights everyone. But I believe everyone sane is capable potentially of some delight. Um, so he's already working in a phenomenon which, unless we are going to talk about the psychological effects of delight, according to Freudians versus Skinnerians, 
in which case we're doing an academic assay. But if I want to measure delight or quantify it in some way, that's not what these uh, these lyrical essays are doing. What he is doing is he is pointing to things the way we might point to facts in an essay to say, I felt this way. I felt this way. This came to me as an experience and that is as real in a certain way as facts. Um, and so he's up to something else. He is making us consider the nature of delight and the nature of how we present factual information. And to some degree, whether or not we can include our experience of delight as factual or as weighty, as important as statistics or, you know, the doctor's prognosis or uh, the new piece of legislation just passed. He's, at, he's, he's wondering largely about how we deal with an unempirical thing in a world that in a culture that particularly values empirical things. I'm not sorry we value empirical things. It's why we have dental floss, running water, electricity, the internet. Um, I think empirical things are incredibly important. But Ross Gay is right. He is, he is right to tell us that delight matters, that how we experience the world in subjective terms has a value at least on a personal level, on a lyrical level, that requires us weighing this. Because when we remember our lives, it probably won't be the statistics we remember on our deathbed. I'm guessing. I don't even think statisticians remember the statistics. They remember things both happy and sad that happened to them over the years that matter to them because statistics are valuable and sometimes they are indispensably important for us understanding the world. But Roske's essential argument underneath this all seems to be that delight matters. Things like gratitude matter. Things like our life and dreams matters. And indeed poetry speaks to us in the language of dreams in a way that a newspaper article simply isn't going to do. And that's great. We need both. We need the facts. And if we can't escape the feelings, maybe we can find a way to be gloriously enriched by them.